The concepts. We discussed the concepts, and we had spreadsheets similar to one that Alcoa had used. Mm -hmm. um, I can tell you this was not the emphasis of what they hired us to do. Um, we didn't have software that was very sophisticated in plotting these curves. I mean, this this literally is the only math behind this, mm -hmm. and you can do it in Excel in two minutes. And that equation is out of Kingman, which is what from the 70s. So this was not the emphasis of the software. But it is the kind of math that's behind our product. And that's, that's just aggregate variability, right? That's not looking right. at the right. source of the variability. Right. right. It, it aggregates all arrival variabilities into one term and all process variabilities into another term. And you, you come up with that aggregate level, and it's uh, aggregate level. So it's good for the concept, but it's not good for good analysis. OK. So you saw this graph earlier. Basically what they changed is these boxes in yellow is where they made a lot of changes in this phase two of the improvement effort. Uh, we came up with a WIP uh, controlling mechanism called CONWIP. Everybody's heard about that from the Alcoa case. And we measured cycle time through the system so they could see exactly how long it was taking each batch to get through the system. They couldn't see that before. Uh, we changed some things around demand management, and we changed some things around production tracking. So let me show you that. So did you try to put Kanbans in here? I mean, you, you're saying, OK, we did Conwip setting. But what was the process by which you figured out that other things that were more traditional at that time wouldn't work? And how did you figure out that Conwip was the right solution? That's a good question. Um, for their highest volume flow path, Kanban would work and actually suggested to them Kanban. Um, they were not comfortable with Kanban for a couple of reasons. Um, so then we investigated ways that they could use something for, the, the biggest issue they had was they could see how Kanban would work for their high volume flow pass. They couldn't see how it would work for their low volume flow pass. Because they had some products going down a low volume flow path that they only make you know, every six months, every 12 months, every year and a half. And they said, if we have Kanban, then we're going to have those products on the floor every day. And that's a waste of space. We don't have the space. And they, for some reason, didn't want to have two different methodologies, even though for the high volume, that might have worked better. Um, I actually recommended that they do simple Kanban for the high volume to keep it simple. Um, and uh, what they decided is, and we'd have to go through the process flow, is rather than have two parallel loops with Kanban on the upstream loop and Conwip on the downstream loop. They said, let's do Conwip on the whole loop. That's the, that's the long answer. So they had one combined, just one loop, and that all those seven flow paths? No, they had one loop for each of the seven flow paths. <coughs> oh, so they had seven loops. Yeah. And the focus on the Conwip was the first two, the high line. In fact, I think that picture is coming up here in a second. Everybody recognizes that screen? I, I stole it from Alcoa, and Glenn liked it, so we put it in here. <clears throat> so um, you'll recognize some of these things because they were identical to the Alcoa case. Um, they changed how people were organized and how they were measured to motivate them to think differently. Before the project, people were thinking about their department. How can I make compression work well? How can I make blending work well? They changed that so that people would think more about the flow paths. And they put in place measures like first time through. First time through is just for every batch that went through, what percentage of them came through with absolutely no quality problems? And most of the time that you have a quality problem, it was caused by some early department, and it wasn't identified until some later department. So the only way you can get first time through to improve is to work together as a team across the flow path so the upstream department isn't causing the problem that's identified downstream by the downstream department. We also did cycle time metrics, which was a great way to get everybody thinking about how fast the material is running through the whole flow path, much like what Alcoa did. Um, they assigned technical resources 24-7 to each flow path, similar to the maintenance people at Alcoa that could move from the department that didn't have any downtime to wherever the constraint was if there was downtime. And they did similar things with their engineers and their chemists and things like that. Um, 
and they automatically published metrics daily on their intranet site. I'll show you some screenshots of that. So, you know, I, I don't want to, I don't want to pass over this too soon, but we already talked a lot about what Alcoa did, and this was similar to promote flow path accountability. <coughs> this is what happened to their first time through after they started to organize this way by flow path. Um, it had been around 20 to 30 percent, which is lower than the industry average. Um, I think the industry average is around 60 to 70, so they were pretty bad on this metric. Um, but by getting people assigned to flow paths, it became very obvious if someone upstream had caused something that caused first pass quality to be less than perfect downstream. And you started to have a team that could cooperate across the departments instead of departments kind of doing this to each other on what, who had caused the first pass quality metric. This was also their biggest source of variation or variability. Because if you have a batch with a quality problem, you have to quarantine that batch and figure out what the problem is before you can keep that batch moving. And when they say a quality problem, it might be literally as simple as on a 300 page stack of paperwork that goes along with each batch called the batch record. If someone doesn't put a date next to their initial on page 260, that's a first pass quality problem, first time through problem. But you have to quarantine that batch and do an investigation, whether it's a minor thing like that or a major thing like the chemistry didn't meet spec. And that can take weeks to get disposition or deviations or do all the investigation that's required so that if the FDA audits you, you can prove that you've investigated it to prevent any bad drug from getting the warning place. So what they were having was two thirds of their batches were getting delayed somewhere by weeks and you can imagine what that was doing to their delivery performance and their cycle time. Um, this is what happened to their cycle time. Um, when we started, it was about 142 days, roughly six months, five and a half months. They set a goal of 70 days. And over the course of, uh, what is that, about 10 months, they were able to hit their goal. And they did it the same way Alcoa did it. They just set the conduit target. and. Um, decided how much they were going to have, and then released more work onto the flow path when the flow path needed more work. So Tom, this idea of the, the silos getting broken down, managing flow paths instead of managing departments, I mean, obviously that's a common thread between this and Alcoa. How many companies do you think still haven't figured that out? I mean, is that kind of like a problem that was solved in the 80s and maybe the laggards in the 90s? Or, you know, like, I'll ask, I'll ask the audience that. There's a lot of manufacturing experience in the room. What I think almost think? everybody still yeah. does it departmentally. Yeah. I, I do, too. Do. It's, no, it's, it's really intuitive, I think, because you want it, people still it, people still look at efficiencies. People still look at all those things. I'm sure less and less, but at least when I stopped, when I left that world, everyone just you do your job the best you can, and my boss worries about me doing my job the best I can. Don't worry about the other It seems like that. I mean. I mean, that's obviously a lean concept, but, but this the basic idea of no more silos seems to be something that would resonate. You know, if it doesn't resonate with somebody, it's probably but not going to be that It's hard to implement. It's hard to implement. I mean, think about even with uh, Indiana Technical Operations, when they have those meetings that I heard about, they still, they still have the departments or supervisors all there, they just manage it through you know, getting together, so they still kind of divide it up. Along those lines, when, <clears throat> when, you, when you introduced this, this flow path concept, has it required physical movement of equipment and departments? Um, in both of these cases, no. No. Mm -hmm. and, and most of the traditional lean folks start there, start there. Um, now, in the Siemens case study, which is not scheduled, but I'm happy to, to give to, to you or a smaller group, we did. We relocated close to 70 pieces of equipment to get things in line. So stuff would move straight from the output of one machine to the input of the next machine. Did you use software to do that, or was it intuitive? Uh, we used a little bit of software to do that, yeah. Um, and a whole lot of engineering elbow grease to figure out which machine to put into the cell and not put into the cell. Is that something we would want to consider for the capability? Possibly, yeah. Yeah. 
Um, it, it plays more onto the high volume side of the house because you can only dedicate.